EU leaders have backed new sanctions against Iran following last weekend's attack on Israel. During talks in Brussels on Wednesday, they decided to direct sanctions at Tehran's drone and missile producers. These were used extensively in the assault. The leaders also discussed the wars in Gaza and in Ukraine. Bradley Bowman is Senior Director at the Foundation for Defence of Democracies in Washington, D.C. Welcome back to DW, Bradley. Tell us, what's your opinion on new sanctions against Iran? Do you think that they'll have the desired impact? I think the uh, new sanctions on uh, missile and drone, Iranian missiles and drones is laudable. It's necessary, but far from sufficient. I mean, this is a logical step, right? We had uh, more than 350 uh, missiles and drones launched at Israel in an unprecedented direct attack from the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, we saw a, a lifting of sanctions following uh, uh, as, as part of the Iran deal uh, that uh, many thought was unwise. And this is beginning to walk some of that back. But I would say this is just a first step of many sanctions that should be restored and actually enforced. We've seen a real problem with Iranian oil imports. And the more oil they import, of course, the more revenue they have. And they're not going to build, spend that money on helping the Iranian people, of course. They're going to spend that money on building more missiles and drones and exporting more terrorism. Uh, so, so you're saying that the sanctions are far from sufficient. I explain uh, where you think they, they should be headed and, and, and what should be agreed next. Yeah, no, I don't mean to be reflexively critical. I mean, I want to look at these sanctions in detail and see how strong they are. But if uh, it seems like a logical and appropriate step to sanction the tools by which uh, Iran conducted this attack. So th that's laudable for sure. But I'm just saying there's a lot of existing sanctions that are already on the books, both in the U.S. and in Europe. They're not being enforced. And I, and, and I named oil and sanctions as one of them. Uh, and you also have other uh, uh, sanctions related to the arms embargo and, and more broadly that could be snapped back. And uh, as members of uh, the UN Security Council, France, UK and US unilaterally could do that simply with a letter. And so I would encourage that those governments to consider that step. If we're speaking about new sanctions, five years ago, the US government designated Iran's notorious revolutionary guards as a terrorist organization. Uh, why do you think the EU hasn't done this yet if we're talking about sanctions? It's a great question. I, I think um, it's a mistake not to do so. The Iran, we often say, uh, I think accurately, is the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. And the means by which the Islamic Republic of Iran conducts that terrorism is the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, specifically their Quds Force. Uh, and so uh, let me just highlight that the individuals Camille, uh, killed in the April 1 Damascus strike uh, uh, were IRGC officers who were busy doing what? They were smuggling weapons to Hezbollah for the purposes of targeting Israelis in their homes. And by, by the way, we've seen uh, uh, thousands of rockets and missiles launched at Israel from Lebanon since October 8th. So a lot of focus has been on Gaza, as it should be. There's now a lot of focus on this unprecedented direct attack from Iran. But don't miss the uh, the, the low scale and some not not sometimes not so low scale war that's already going on in Israel's north as well with the varsity terror proxy team, and that's Hezbollah. Mm. The fact that Iran directly attacked Israel for the first time on Saturday, despite uh, all the warnings, Iran has crossed this line now. Do you think it's going to be possible to return to what is known as a shadow war that we've known about all these years? It's a great question. For more than four decades, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran has pursued a asymmetrical terror uh, proxy strategy where they've advanced their foreign policy and attacked their neighbours while displacing the uh, consequences and counterpunches on to others. It's often said that Iran is happy to fight Israel to the last Arab. Uh, but now we see uh, an unprecedented direct attack from Iran. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that the Middle East has changed. I don't want to overplay it. But uh, you're going to see, um, I fear, if the United States and Israel in particular don't respond strongly enough, this is, this is you know, the Rubicon has been crossed. I think they're going to feel that they can do this again in the future. And Israel certainly feels like it now has license to attack, certainly covertly, what it's already been doing inside Iran, but, but overtly. And so I think the Middle East will be changed. 
uh, I think it does remind uh, everyone, anyone who's willing to be objective about this, that the real threat to regional security is Iran. And it really, uh, I think, prioritizes the need for building a uh, comprehensive regional security architecture that includes Arabs, Americans, and Israelis, not for the purpose of aggression, but for the purpose of detecting, deterring, and defeating aggression when it comes. There's been quiet work for years on this between the US and its Gulf Cooperation Council countries with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates in the lead. Um, but you know, let, let's look at what happened this weekend. You had the Jordanians helping Israel defeat this attack from Iran. You have reports of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates potentially sharing intelligence that was useful in defeating this attack. And so this really was the region saying, uh, no, Iran, we don't support what you did, and we're going to help defeat this attack that was aimed at killing Israelis in their homes. Some analysts have, call, have been calling this a, an Arab-Israeli axis. Do you agree with that characterization? Yeah, you know, the, these, these labels get thrown around. I mean, I think the bottom line is that what was so significant about the Abraham Accord, Accords a few years ago by which, uh, uh, by which Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates normalized relations with Israel is that they were publicly acknowledging what Arab, most Arab governments have known for a long time. And that's what I said earlier, that the main problem, the main threat, the, the threat in the region is the, Islam, is the Islamic Republic of Iran, not Israel. And so they were simply publicly and diplomatically acknowledging what they know to be true. And, you know, like, like a bully on the playground, Iran wants to keep the other kids divided and distracted. And, and that's one of the great negative consequences, I would say, of the horrific October 7th attack on Israel, the worst slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust, is that it slowed normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Um, but I don't think it ended it. And I think it would be a mistake to let those efforts end, because that truly would be good news for Saudi Arabia, good news for Israel, good news for the region, and bad news for the Islamic Republic of Iran, which wants to conduct aggression, because uh, it really would uh, identify who the real threat is and would build that comprehensive regional security architecture that I was talking about that will make it harder to conceal aggression and get away and get away with it. I want to go back and talk a little bit about what you were saying earlier and, and the response to, to, these, uh, to this assault by Iran over the weekend. Israel says it's going to retaliate. We don't know when or how. Uh, what do you think we can expect in terms of the Israeli reaction? You know, it's hard to say in terms of the when and how. You're, exa you're asking a very fair question. Um, you know, I follow these issues closely. For my part, I hope that Israel takes its time. I, I think uh, the world is reminded of who the real villain is in, in the region. Uh, Israel's beginning to pocket some important concessions or advances, if you will, from, um, from its uh, European and American partners. I think it should continue that, um, and, uh, but definitely has to respond. Uh, you know, uh, if, if Israel is only in the business of receiving punches and not counterpunching, that's a formula for getting more punches. And so they have to respond, they, it, but uh, how they respond, I think is a matter of debate. You could see everything from something all the way uh, from an attack on Iran's nuclear program and the regime itself, which really is the puppet master orchestrating these terror pu uh, puppets, proxy puppets. Or you could see uh, attacks on their energy infrastructure or military bases or uh, more attacks on IRGC forces uh, throughout the region, particularly in Syria, or a combination of them and also with cyber effects, not just kinetic. So there's a range of activities but the main point here to take away, I think, for your viewers, is that on Friday, pre the Friday before the attack, President Biden was asked what he wanted to say to the Islamic Republic of Iran. And he said, don't, don't. How did Iran respond? They shrugged and proceeded to conduct an unprecedented attack on the state of Israel. Clearly, American and Israeli deterrence is tattered. That is unacceptable and dangerous, I would say. And Israel, understandably, after having 350 missiles and drones launched them, feels a need to respond to restore deterrence. And there's two types of deterrence. There's deterrence by denial and deterrence by punishment. And in a tough neighborhood, in a tough region, you can't neglect the deterrence by punishment. Good to talk with you, Bradley Bowman, with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Thank you so much for your analysis, Bradley. Thank you. Let's pick up a couple of those points with Dr. Arash Azizi, who's a writer and historian. He authored a book called The Shadow Commander, Soleimani, the US and Iran's Global Ambitions. A welcome to uh, DW. Are more sanctions, do you think, an effective response to Iran's uh, strike on Israel? 
I, I mean, I don't think sanctions do much by this point. Iran is already one of the most sanctioned, con- I mean, it's probably the most sanctioned country in the world. It also happens to have relations with uh, Russia, which is already another heavily sanctioned country. Um, we've already seen that a lot of countries don't honor sanctions or find ways of going around them. And even those who want to enforce them um, find uh, sort of a bit of exhaustion around them. So, no, I think sanctions will have limited effect. Okay, so looking at what happened last Saturday and the repercussions, Iran has warned that it would strike again with greater force if Israel or the US retaliate for their retaliation for Israel's strike on Iran's consular building in Syria. So do you think Iran is prepared for uh, Israel to escalate? I think they're not prepared. I think they uh, thought they could do this attack and, frankly, get away with it. They've been going out of their way to say, we warned the other countries uh, beforehand. Um, The head of the um, political ideological office of Khamenei, so basically someone close to the supreme leader, um, said that, uh, you know, emphasized that we didn't want to uh, kill anybody in this attack. Um, Iranian diplomats beforehand went out of the way to say we didn't target population centers. So no, uh, I don't think uh, they're ready for escalation with Israel. I mean, I think they know that there's a appetite against it in the United States, investing capitals um, in the region. Certainly the Arab countries definitely don't want a Iran-Israel war to break out. That can be a catastrophe for everyone. So no, I don't think the Islamic Republic is uh, prepared for it at all, and I don't think it wanted it. I think it took the risk of the April 13 attacks, hoping that it can get away with it without a direct confrontation with Israel. It's interesting, isn't it? Because, of course, Iran doesn't want this, and Israel probably can't afford to fight two wars at the same time. Yeah, look, it's this is this is a, a f- interesting thing uh, that I think neither Iran nor Israel, nor United States, not Arab countries, not Europe, uh, not the people of Iran, not the people of Israel, not the people of the United States. I don't think anyone wants this war. Like I think um, the 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 Israelis who are now calibrating what target to pick, they're hoping they're able to attack a, a, a somewhere or or some place that um, that could not lead to Iranian retaliation. But of course, everyone every side has to speak of retaliation. There is this idea of deterrence also. Although many scholars, when they look at it, I mean, it's not really clear what this deterrence means all the time. Um, because you know you you think you can, you're deterred, but you can also get yourself into a bigger conflict, and then the cycle continues. Uh, what is so? I think nobody wants this war. Certainly, on the Iranian society, no one is interested in fighting Israel. Um, you know, Iranians as a whole don't really feel like they have a stake um, in the conflict of Israel uh, with with the Arab neighbors in many ways, and um, they're they're not interested in joining this fight, um, and they certainly don't support the regime's uh, anti-Israel foreign policy there. Um, um, so look, on a popular level and on a government level, I don't think people want this war. But unfortunately, the history is full of wars that began based on miscalculations um, of others um, and uh, wars that ironically no one wanted, but it's still they broke out. So this is why it's a moment that calls for serious leadership um, on side of all the states involved um, to prevent uh, the escalation and, and breaking out of a direct war, something that has been a threat uh, since the last six months. In fact, it has been a threat for many years now, and I hope we can do anything, everything possible to avoid it. And, and a word then about where support for Iran might come from, because the narrative tends to be that uh, Iran is a pariah, it's, a, it's, um, it's operating uh, in the shadows and in the corners. Does it have any friends that would support it uh, in a potential uh, uh, further strike? Well, first of all, of course, uh, the Islamic Republic sits at the top of a uh, the so-called axis of resistance, a group of militias in the region that are very significant political and military forces in their own countries. The Houthis are uh, effectively the Iran Yemen, um, and they are perhaps one of the most seriously anti-Israel forces in the region. There are all these Iraqi militias. Today, the Iraqi prime minister is allied with them, with the pro-Tehran militia. So in many ways, the governments that are controlling the capitals of Yemen and, and Iraq are um, are uh, allied with Iran. In Lebanon, of course, is Hezbollah that has the, um, that is the, a uh, strongest force in Lebanese society in, in many ways in terms of its, I think it's hated by many Lebanese people, but materially it has a strong military power 
um, and it doesn't have much rivals. So there, there's Lebanon, the Syrian regime, that's more complicated. I, I don't think the Syrian regime would in any way at all want to join a fight with Israel. But it doesn't all have the power on its uh, on its own. The, the axis uh, operates on Syrian territory. When it comes to other countries, um, you know, they'll decide on case by case basis. Uh, Russia and China have some relations with Iran. They, I don't think they want to get into a, a fight with Israel. Um, Arab countries are mostly pro Western in the region, um, other than the ones that I mentioned. Um, uh, but, you know, but they are also they don't want to get into a fight. They're pro Western, but they're not pro Israeli. Um, they don't want to get into uh, this fight. So I think the uh, regional picture um, is quite complicated when it comes to the war. But what is very clear though is that. And, you know, this will be a terrible war um, that nobody can afford. I and mean, a lot of these countries that I mentioned, I mean, Yemen and Syria and Iraq have experienced different versions of civil wars for much of the last 20 years. Lebanon um, is economically destroyed, a, a very exhausted place. Uh, these right. are not places that are ready for war. So a war would be a catastrophe uh, on every level um, for all the constitutions, the constituencies involved. A fascinating analysis. Thank you for walking us through that. Writer, historian and political scientist uh, Arash Azizi. Thank you. William Wexler is Senior Director of the Rafik Hariri Centre and Middle East Programmes at the Atlantic Council. Uh, welcome to DW. Uh, let's start with that complicated balancing act uh, facing Arab countries in this conflict. Does future cooperation with Arab states like Saudi Arabia form part of Israel's calculation when it comes to calibrating its response to Iran's attack? Absolutely. Uh, one of the real differences in what we've seen now and what we saw just a little while ago is that the, Israel's war in Gaza was dividing it from its Arab neighbors. Israel's conflict with Iran is bringing Israel together with its Arab neighbors. So it's a very different dynamic. So too much and you risk inflaming the, the inflaming allies that you spent decades uh, uh, trying to get on side. Indeed, the average um, uh, Arab um, is very upset about Israel's war in Gaza. Um, the average Arab government is very concerned about the threat that Iran uh, poses. So it's a balancing act um, that uh, that these governments have to do. Most of these governments also have no love lost for Hamas. Um, so it's a balancing act that they've been doing now ever since October 7th. And, and Jordan's position uh, seems particularly precarious. How does uh, Jordan's King Abdullah balance strong public support for Palestinians with shooting down uh, Iranian uh, missiles? Well, it's a very clear narrative for him. Um, he is defending the sovereignty of Jordanian airspace. The Iranians uh, entered into his airspace. That was an invasion of sovereignty um, without the permission of Jordan. And so he was fully in his rights to defend his country and his people um, from those. That's the narrative that he is presenting to his people. That's a narrative that he's written to the world. That is also legally and practically correct. It will also be viewed by some as uh, a support for Israel. And is there any benefit to Iran? from Jordan shooting down Iranian missiles? Well, Iran is trying to walk a very fine line of their own. They're trying to uh, enhance deterrence against Israel because they're very upset about the success that Israel has had in targeting a number of senior uh, Iranian military leaders. They're also trying to um, not provoke a wider regional war. They're very happy with the situation that they have. And they're trying to create a new normal, which allows them to strike directly at Israel for the very first time. And for that to somehow be accepted as, uh, as a way of behavior that, okay. um, uh, that, that aligns with the rest of their malign behavior throughout the region. We'll pick that apart now. Firstly, why did Iran decide that now was the time to attack Israel directly instead of through proxies? Really because of Israel's success. Um, back in the beginning of the month, they, uh, they targeted a number of senior uh, leaders, um, including one that was very important to the Quds Force, um, one that has a personal relationship with the Supreme Leader in Iran. Um, and they killed him. Um, and that w was seen by Iran as something that they had to respond to. 
um, they don't like the fact that Israel is so successful at taking out their, their generals. Okay, and so this new normal that you mentioned, tell us how Iran benefits from that. This is uh, part of the Iranian playbook for many decades now. What they do is they march up the escalation ladder until they're pushed down, they march back up again, and what they try to do is create an environment in which they can get the world to accept behavior that would otherwise be considered completely unacceptable. They are literally the only country in the world that routinely gives precision weaponry to non-state actors and instructs them to fire them across international borders to intentionally target civilians, but they do that so routinely that we don't even comment on it. They've had, the, they've had their allies in Hezbollah move tens of thousands of Israelis out of their home in the north. A year ago, that would have you would have said that was a prelude to war, but they've done that below war. They have their allies, the Houthis, um, in the Bab el-Mendem Strait, shut down all international shipping. Again, a year ago, that would have been a prelude to war. They've been able to do that below the threshold of war. And now so, they're trying to establish the ability to, to hit Israel directly from it, Iranian territory. So given that new normal, as you describe it, if Israel does act militarily and decisively, what does Iran do? Does it go back up that escalation ladder? Does it want a full-on direct conflict with Israel? Iran doesn't want a full-on conflict, and Israel shouldn't want a full-on conflict. Israel has its hand full in Gaza uh, right now, and, and there are other uh, military activities that they need to do. Um, so hopefully uh, uh, we won't be in that scenario. What folks in Jerusalem are trying to figure out is how do they send a signal that tells uh, Iran that they do not accept the ability for Iran to target them directly, but at the same time does not result in a wider regional war. That's, what, that's why they've been taking the days to work this out in Jerusalem. Okay, that's very clear. Thank you so much for walking us through that. William Wexler from the Atlantic Council. Thank you. The Germany's foreign minister has concluded her visit to Israel aimed at diffusing tensions with Iran. Annalena Baerbock met with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to discuss the fallout from Iran's unprecedented aerial attack at the weekend. Earlier in the day, uh, she met with uh, President Isaac Herzog in Jerusalem. Like many of Israel's allies, Germany has been urging de-escalation in this conflict. Speaking at Tel Aviv's Ben-Gurion airport, Ms. Baerbock warned that Iran's attack on Israel shows Tehran is not afraid of escalation. I am reiterating here today my total condemnation of this dangerous act and have told my Israeli partners very clearly, Israel has our complete solidarity. Iran will face consequences. We in the EU are placing sanctions against Iran and will continue to work on these. At the same time, it is critical that this highly flammable situation does not turn into a regional wildfire. Iran and its proxies, like Hezbollah or the Houthis, must not pour any more oil onto the fire. Well, I asked our Jerusalem correspondent Rebecca Ritters whether the Israeli government was likely to heed the German foreign minister's call for restraint. Well, Phil, I, I think these warnings from, from many of Israel's allies will be, take, will be being taken into consideration when it comes to Israel's plan of counterattack. But the question is just how much. We have been seeing Israel taking advice, taking calls from world leaders, including US President Biden, but today we've seen the foreign ministers of the UK and Germany as well, but, but also, uh, you know, listening to regional allies, uh, all of whom have been warning restraint if Israel is going to to attack, as it says uh, it is vowing to do so. It says that it has no choice but to retaliate. Uh, you know, we, we, we're seeing that sort of rhetoric, but we're hearing also uh, Netanyahu saying again today to uh, David Cameron and Annalena Baerbock that Israel would make this decision on its own, that it isn't going to be pressured by the Allies, though it will no doubt be taking, be taking this advice into consideration. Um, uh, you know... 
I, I think the, the, the leaders we've been seeing, it, you know, the War Cabinet meeting day after day and they're not able to reach an agreement. So these calls from regional leaders uh, and from allies certainly playing into the decision. What we are hearing and what we can be pretty sure about is that Israel is going to counter-attack. We've been hearing reporting from Axios, an American outlet, uh, saying that there were that sources within sources close to the discussions were saying that you know Israel had given the decision to, to retaliate on Monday, but had decided not to go ahead with that because of operational reasons. So you know certainly we're teetering on the edge of seeing a retaliation, but of course when and just how severe we, we don't know yet. The German foreign minister also called for more humanitarian aid to be delivered to Gaza's civilian population. How much is getting through now? I think it's safe to say that certainly not enough. That is what humanitarian aid workers on the ground are saying. It is still a humanitarian catastrophe unfolding inside Gaza. We did see a lot of pressure put on Israel in the wake of the attack on the World Central Kitchen uh, aid workers. It killed seven of those aid workers, including uh, foreign nationals. Now, we've seen huge pressure largely from the US but other allies as well, uh, urging Israel to increase uh, the humanitarian uh, aid that it is allowing into the Gaza Strip. They said in the wake of that attack that they were determined to do so. We had the defence minister saying they were going to, quote, flood Gaza with aid. But uh, that is not, in fact, what we're seeing. We have seen an uptick. We've seen uh, the border crossing that they were going to open in the north uh, open, but only one convoy cross over. And we've seen also some aid, though only eight trucks are coming from that Ashdod port, which was another one of the, the measures that they were taking in the wake of that attack. We've seen 200 tr trucks enter just a little over on Monday, comparing that to 500 trucks a day, which is what we were seeing before the war, then, you know, it's certainly we can say there's not enough aid going into Gaza even still. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca Ritters in Jerusalem. As tensions between Israel and Iran increase, the international community is being warned not to lose sight of the conflict in Gaza and the suffering of civilians there. Israel is pressing on with its military campaign, aiming to destroy Hamas, which committed the October 7th terror attacks. The UN has warned of the threat of famine in Gaza and is calling on donor countries to provide nearly $3 billion in additional aid by the end of the year. Urgent supplies descend on Gaza as signs of the war smolder in the distance. These airdrops are a desperately needed lifeline, not only for their food and essentials. What made me resort to this parachute was the lack of cloth in the city. There is nothing, and our house was damaged. We resorted to this parachute, and it was incredible that we were able to make it work. It was not easy, but thanks God it worked. Aid access is still severely restricted. The UN says 40 per cent of attempted deliveries to northern Gaza were denied last week. While most Israeli forces have withdrawn from Gaza, strikes on residential areas continue. Children were among the victims of this bombing in Rafah. Like the rest of Rafah residents, we were shocked when at around 10.45 in the evening, an Israeli rocket hit a house that shelters displaced people. My sister's son-in-law, her daughter and her children were having dinner when an Israeli missile demolished their house over their heads. Death has become a normal thing. The people and the whole world got used to our death. Three people are killed in Gaza, 20 died, 35 died. It has become normal. We have just become numbers. The Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry says nearly 34,000 people have been killed in the conflict. Israeli officials say the war is not over and they still plan to send ground forces into Rafah, where more than half of Gaza's population are sheltering.